was great to be able to connect. And just uh, one last thing. So I sent Bo my book uh, probably maybe three weeks ago, came in the mail. Bo takes a picture, sends it to me and says, got it. Thanks. Love the book. Something along those lines. Yep. And uh, before we started recording, I just said, Bo, it's those little things that I think really develop and build strong relationships. And so commercial real estate, multifamily, it's a relationship business. Um, maybe the first question is, why did you write the book? What was it that uh, <laughs> provoked you to write it and share so much information? Yeah, thanks for, first of all, thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate that. And, you know, it's funny you talk about relationships. It's also a very small world. I mean, when you talk about the multifamily world, you know, I cover the northern half of Florida. Uh, there's only 1,000, literally, like right now, there's exactly 1,000 investors that own every asset in the entire northern half of Florida. And there's, and there's a certain number of brokers, and there's only a certain number of mortgage guys. And so it's a very small world. And so it's just cool how you came across me and how we met and all that stuff. Um, how I read, how I, why I wrote the book. So my coach, I have a commercial real estate coach. His name is Blaine Strickland. Um, he has a coaching company called One More Deal. I've been with him one-on-one -on -one for, I don't know how many years, uh, six, eight years easily. And he's always been pushing me the last few years to write a book. Like I have as brokers, we have sort of inside look yeah. at have some of the most elite guys in the world buy so many investments. And we have an inside look at how some of the crappiest, horrible reputation investors on the planet act and how fast their business goes down. Right. Yeah. And so he says, Bo, you should be sort of the sort of the, the owner, the curator, the, the delivery of the deliverer of this information to the marketplace, because everyone who teaches this stuff usually is an investor themselves. They're a syndication. They have a membership-based platform, but no one knows the inside look at how like brokers are talking to sellers and what they're saying to sellers about buyers and how the reputation gets affected and all this stuff. And so I kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off literally for like two years. And finally, he just annoyed the hell out of me. And I said, you know what? I'm going to write this book. And, and Shane, you have a couple of books, the, uh, the first one of which I read, which I love because it was really in congruence with, with what I wrote in my book. But I just decided, you know what, I'm going to, instead of two days a week of, of, of work, instead of working out five days a work week in the morning, I would wake up at 445 instead and write two days a week. So I started writing and then I took two weekends where I told my wife, I'm going to the beach house. I'm just going to write all day long, both, you know, two, three days in a row. And so I knocked it out in a few months. That was the easy part. It was, as you know, it's getting it published, editing, you know, marketing, the, 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 the graphics, the design, all that stuff. Working with Amazon is, is a whole ordeal in itself, yes. but I'm really glad I did it. The reason I wrote it was twofold. Number one, it was almost like a journal mm -hmm. because I know Shane, you've been a real estate broker in the past, right? And it was, you know, there's so many frustrations in this business. I wanted to be able to, to voice um, to the customer, everything I've ever wanted to say about how to do business correctly and how to grow your portfolio, right? Yeah. Um, and number two, my thought was, you know, this is going to cost money to, to write the book. If I can just gain one more customer, yeah. one, if I can do one extra deal, it would pay for the book. If I can gain one extra elite investor, I'd be happy. And what was really cool was in the first 90 days, I did three extra deals as a direct direct result of the book, and nothing else but those book. Um, that book that those those fees it was five hundred fifty one thousand dollars in fees. I thought it was really really cool. And now it's I'm sure I'm doing other business as a result, but it's it's getting something that's really helpful yes. into the investor's hand, giving them a look at something they'll never be able to see from our side. You know that is um, uh, it, it's one of the biggest challenges, I think, investors coming into the world of commercial real estate uh, find is that if you've, ever, if you've only ever bought residential real estate, right, we'll just use that as kind of the, the baseline. Uh, yeah. There's, there's, you know, 5,500 residential agents in, in Calgary, right, in my market. And so I'm not wow. suggesting everybody treats them like a dime a dozen, but let's face it, right? I mean, you, you know, most of the res agents are like they're there and they're they're doing whatever they can, jumping through the hoops to make an investor happy. Flip it to commercial real estate. There's like three multifamily people that control the entire market. They know the buyers. They know the ask the product. I mean, 
all you have to do is go on on your website or your YouTube videos, and you you know every one of the buyers, the sellers, who's active, right. who's not, and and so that intel takes a long time, and and to say, hey Bo, can I pick your brain and go for a coffee? To me, that is like, uh, you, it just shows the, a lack of respect for. Um, uh, the amount of energy that goes into that, right? That's your intel. That's your competitive advantage. The insights that uh, take years to develop. And so uh, the fact that you wrote a book about it, because really, <laughs> if you're a broker or an investor, I think that people should be reading that because if you're a broker, you get the, it's like a playbook, right? It's like, hey, here are the it things is. that are important. Um, so, well, yeah. And I thought I would sell thousands of books to brokers alone, mm -hmm. right? I mean, like, I, I thought it was an awesome way for a broker to be able to hand someone a book that everything they've ever wanted to say to their customer <laughs> without being the prick that said it, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> but but, there, but there's actually a, a much fewer number of brokers that have done it. And I don't know if it's because they think that they would, you know, not do business with them anymore than come do business with me, which never happens, as you know. Um, but almost all of them have been, have been investors that have been acquiring it and, and anywhere from, you know, sort of the mom and pop guy to, I, I track a lot of this stuff. There's a lot of big REIT and acquisition teams that have acquired it because it's a, you know, it, like I said, it's, it's that inside look. Absolutely. I mean, and I think that for people that are on the outside that have never been a broker, it's, um, extremely valuable to understand what brokers go through, Right. One of the only books that my father-in-law recommended to me was uh, uh, Robert Ringer's Ro Robert Ringer's book. Um, uh, geez, the, the name is escaping me right now, but it's um, ah, it'll come back to me. Do, do you know what it is, Bo? No, uh, no. If you, okay. if you said it, I might have, I might have read it. I was going to look it up. Oh, it's Winning Through Intimidation. That's what it is. Oh, yeah. Right. Great book. Yeah. Great so. Book. I mean, and that, that, that's kind of the dark look of, uh, of brokerage, <laughs> if you will. Yours, is, yours is, has a much more positive uh, uh, spin and, and uh, perspective, if you will. But uh, yeah, I think that, you know, I don't, I don't know where I was going to go with that, but I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of um, change gears a little bit because one of the things that I think very few brokers do, and you kind of touched on it in terms of why they may be um, nervous to either buy your book or share it with their clientele. And that is in fear of competition. Right. And I think that the, the world of, of commercial brokers, at least where I came from, it is, um, fairly, uh, well, it's, it's hyper competitive. And so people are very guarded in terms of like, even when I wrote my book, they were like, why are you sharing that information? Thinking that there was some sort of a secret that was going to help someone. And then it was going to come back negatively on me. And, who knows, maybe that happens, but I think the bigger picture is to attract more people into your world. And that's yeah. really where I wanted to go with this question is like, um, why did you start sharing information, YouTube? I mean, like some of the, the videos that you share are just tremendous and they've got a lot of views. So I'm curious, like, was that Blaine that also suggested that or did you come up with it on your own? Because not many agents do that. Um, I have been, I've always, from the very beginning, when I started actually in the late nineties, have always been the data guy. I, mean, I just, I love spreadsheets. I love numbers. And I always, I was the only one in my market early on that would share reports, share information. The reason I do it is number one, it's public information. I mean, especially in the state of Florida where everything is already out there, it's available. All I've done is spent the time to curate it. Yeah into an easy to read format and put it out there, okay? Whereas, you know, brokers in the past, I think what's happened is for so many years, access to this kind of information was not really available. You know, before the 2000s, it was hard to get. Yeah. Whereas now, you know, websites like CoStar, Reese, all these places, it's there. It's not maybe not put together in a format that's easy to read in 10 seconds in an email or in a postcard. But that's what I'm good at is taking information and, and, and taking the stuff out that I know investors want to see rather than all the mumbo jumbo and putting it out there. Right. And by doing so, you know, they're not finding this information on hardly anybody else's websites. And I think a lot of brokers are still under that old guard where, hey, that information is our value. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's really not. It's, it's really not what, you know, in fact, 
you know, the number one thing that, that investors look for in a broker, and I do a lot of polling on LinkedIn. So I'm yeah. referencing my website right now. Yeah. I've actually created a, a web, I've actually created a page on my website um, about, about all my polls, but I did a, I did a poll recently that said, um, you know, what is the most important trait you look for when hiring a multifamily listing agent to sell your asset, yeah. right? And the four choices I gave was experience, you know, number of years you've been in the business, your sales volume, right? The size of your brokerage, you know, C.B. Richard Ellis, Marcus Amilichap, Cobalt sure. Banker, whoever, you know, independent, whoever you are. And the fourth one was likability and reachability. Now, the likability and reachability I put in there because I couldn't think of anything else. Like I was just like, ah, okay, LinkedIn allows you to do four choices and I put it in there. <laughs> Guess what the number one choice was? 51% yeah. of investors said likability and reachability was the number one thing they choose, right? Now, why am I saying that? Well, because giving out information and being a resource and giving value and adding value and not trying to just make a commission is likability and being able to be reached. One of the main complaints about brokers, you never get a hold of guys, yeah. right? And you may get my voicemail a lot. I'm on the phone a lot, but I'm gonna call you right back, right? 51% said likability. Number two, was sales volume, 32%. Yeah. What I thought the answer was going to be, and it's probably just because of my own personal bias and be, having been scared to death that when I sold my Coldwell Banker commercial last year and I went independent, yeah. part of my angst was, oh, I'm not C.B. Richard Ellis. I'm not Marcus and Millichap. Are people still going to use me? Are they still going to follow me? Do you know what percent of investors said the size of the brokerage was the most important thing? I'm going to guess like zero or well, 1%, one person said it. 1% gave a shit about what company you were with. Yeah. And I've always thought it in my mind that, that investors follow agents, not companies. Correct. And so I've always felt like if the big nationals would take all those spending dollars they spend all over the place saying, we have this many agents and we do this much sales volume and we're the number one company according to Lipsy. Nobody gives a shit. If they just took that money and put it in the hands of a guy like Shane, okay, when you were with your other brokerage, yeah. who's, who Shane is phenomenal at marketing, could do more for that company than that company can do for themselves. If you put that money into the hands of a Bo Beery, I'll make NAI, Marcus and Miller Chaps, Hewitt, Dallas Cars sing, dude, yeah. right? They've got to change their game or they're going to have more and more guys like me go independent and I'm keeping all my franchise fees and I'm keeping all my cuts with the house and I'm just going to make a killing. You know, it's so funny you say that. Um, I remember <clears throat> when I was at Avison and, and I, you know, I really liked the company. I was, you know, uh, honored Great company, to be, by yeah, the way. I, I was honored to be there. But one of the challenges was like half goes to the house. And at a certain point I said, like, is the house bringing me deals or am I having to go out and earn these deals? Right. And that was, um, and it's important even for, you know, so how does this relate to an investor? Well, knowing this, it's like, uh, Bo doesn't need to do twice as many deals because he doesn't have to give half to the house, for example. Right. I mean, that's, and, and you can focus on doing, you know, less and and really working with and it, it's another reason why some of the big shops kind of shy away from doing small deals and at least in my experience right because right. they're going to make as much as a residential uh you know like by the time that you've got five people on a team 50 percent goes to the house and each person gets their cut and then you got a marketing person you it's there's so many mouths to feed that yeah. this is what goes on behind the scenes so even though you think you're writing a two hundred fifty thousand dollar check at the end of the day the guy's like Okay, well, that was a lot of work to make 15 grand well, or something, you, right? <laughs> you saw that chapter in my book. Part of uh, There's a chapter in my book, educating right. investors on what percent of the dollar they pay their agent and think is unjust, how much actually goes in that one guy's pocket, right? Yeah. And what I have determined is, is that most heavy hitters in national companies are a two-partner team. Right. We all know them. It's usually, you know, so and so and so and so. And that's who you use at the brokerage. Yeah. Well, what happens is when that two hundred thousand dollar fish commission comes in, there's a franchise fee. Yeah. There's a cut with the house. Yeah. Right. Then there's two partners that gets cut in half again. 
And then they have all of their, you know, they have their analysts, they have their assistant, they have all that. And so I determine in two partner heavy hitter companies, the one agent you're working with on average makes less than 30% of what you just paid them. Yep, for sure. Right. So what does that do to the kind of quality service you're getting as an investor? Do you want to work with someone who's disincentivized that much? Or do you want to work with someone? And this is not an advertisement for me. I'm just no. asking out there. Yeah. Or do you want to work with someone who they're collecting all of it? And as a result, they're going to give you one hell of a customer service. If they don't, freaking can them. Yep. Yep. I love it. So um, prior to the conversation today, I was thinking about, I, I put myself in the shoes of someone that uh, is new maybe to investing in commercial real estate, buying multifamily. And, and I know this just from having probably thousands of conversations now, one of the biggest challenges is how do they show up on your radar and how do they build that relationship, right? Because you've already got, and I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but in my mind, like when I was a broker, it's kind of like, if a deal comes across my desk, I've already got my A buyers, right? Like the, yep. the people that have already track record that are, that are there, but let's say you're new, you're eager, you have capital, but you, you have not transacted yet. How do I show up on Bo's radar in such a way that you're going to give me a shot, if that makes sense? Yeah. I mean, uh, they may not like this answer, but I feel, I believe, and I know yeah. that the number one thing I can say is you have to hook up with someone who is awesome. Right. That's the fastest way. Um, you can be worth $20 million and, and, and have you know, some bit of knowledge and you've read a bunch of books but if you haven't done deals, if you haven't transacted, if you don't have history, why am I and or the seller going to choose you over someone who does, right? And so I think, I think it's just a huge propeller for your career if you can hook up with someone who has experience, owns units, has liquidity, has the debt relationships, you partner up, you create a relationship. And once you got a few deals under your belt and have created a reputation for yourself, it'll be so much easier. And, and yes, that may mean that you have to give up the vast majority of the pie, okay, yes. to learn. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, this, is, this is newbie university, all right? You're yep. going to have to pay for it a little bit. Um, but it, it just doesn't work any other way. I don't, I don't know people who consistently win or win hardly anything that were a newbie in a 10, you know, a 10 offer, multiple offer situation. Yeah. Like, because probably six of those 10 guys are turning in just as good an offer and they're closers. Yeah. And I can call brokers who have worked with them. And I can call lenders who have worked with them. And I can call sellers who have already done deals with them, right? And so brokers and sellers want the same thing that a newbie would want if they were a seller, which is a sure thing to close. Yeah. And that's how you have to think. And so there is a way where you can easily market yourself as having, you know, you and your partner own six assets that are a thousand units each. Right. You may not own shit, you might not own any of them, but you're linked up with a partner and together you have this LLC and together you're buying this, that's way more attractive. Yeah, and um, I, I think that that is uh, my experience as well, right? Because sellers, brokers, they want deal certainty. And that, and that really comes from a track record, right? You can't really falsify or fake it. Now, I will... Uh, I, I want to get your, your, your perspective on this because I know when we went into the U S in 08, 09, mm -hmm. there were not a lot of multifamily buyers. Right. And so even though we were a fairly big, I say, we, it wasn't me per personally, but it was the company I was representing and we went into Houston and it was like, you know, the taps had been shut off. And so we were able to get the attention of brokers because the pendulum had swung to a buyer's market. And so mm -hmm. in your experience in a buyer's market, because right now it's a very frothy seller's market. I, I mean, I, I, it seems yeah. like pretty much every sure. place in, in Canada and the US, but in a buyer's market, do you see the potential for buyers that have little to no experience um, that there's a little more leverage that they have because they- Sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm just I mean, curious. Then, then it's a game of liquidity. It's a game yes. of liquidity and- a simple letter from a financer that says, yeah, this dude's got, you know, uh, X number of dollars in his bank account. We, you know, we've underwritten the deal. We're good to go. That can easily be done. Yeah. But in a frothy situation, everyone has that. That's right. 
right? So then, and then you go to the next tier of yes. who's the best to choose to win this deal. So let's talk about that because I'm, um, I know when, when the market shifted. So in 09, 010, we were like, we were winning and then 11 and then we're best in final. And it's like, what's your cost of capital? And you're going through these interviews and I'm thinking, what the <laughs> hell is this? This is like, cause I had never experienced this. And right. then in 2016, when we were selling, it was like, ah, I like this seat right now. I'm in the, right. I'm in the driver's seat, basically qualifying. And it was amazing. Like we're talking hedge funds and massive, you know, multi-billion dollar companies. And you're, you're kind of vetting them sensitively, right? You don't want to be too, too uh, uh, arrogant sure. about it, but how do you, how do you win those bid situations in, in your experience? Uh, so in, in nice frothy markets like this, yeah. right. Um, <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's always using the empathy hat, right? You're, yeah. all, you're just, just putting your seller hat on, like what, what's attractive to you. So what I do when I present offers to a seller, and I believe all brokers do this in some capacity or form. Yes. For me, I use a simple Excel spreadsheet. So when I'm, when I'm working with a seller, I have a two tab spreadsheet. Okay. One tab is a list of all the buyers that have called in, that I've called, that I've made contact with. So I give the name of the company, the principal. Then I have a column that says what they've said or what their action is, whether they've rejected it, whether they're taking a look at it, whether they're underwriting or whatever it is, right? So every, every Friday on my marketing process, I'm turning in this two-tab spreadsheet. So they see all of the activity. The second tab is the offer tab, right? So one column is the name of the buyer, then it's the principal's name, it's the price offered, the price of unit, the price of bed, due diligence period, closing period, is it contingent on financing, have they toured the asset, Yes. and then there's a notes section, Yeah. right? So the answer to your question is, among those columns I just said, that's what we're working with. So I literally have an Excel spreadsheet, and once you once you, once you narrow it down to that kind of format, it's really easy to see who the good choices are. Sure. And so you're working with the note, to me, the note section is the most important part. That's where I'm putting notes about that buyer into the seller. Yeah. And the notes can be something like, hey, this guy, Shane, he owns six apartment complexes, 1,200 units. One of them is in the same territory, one mile from your property. Uh, this guy I did a deal with in 2009, backed out day before closing. This guy is a newbie, doesn't own anything, but has good liquidity. And I just go down the list, right? And then when we get on the phone together, me and the seller, I dive even deeper into the notes, sure. right? Now that's in addition to, we're looking at due diligence, closing, but, but the other things that are most important to me are, um, I don't see anybody winning with a financing contingency these days. No. It just doesn't happen. Unless it is a, an asset that is hairy, well, you know, one that has some some difficulties with it, it it's it's just known to be you know uh, not as desirable. Then we may allow it because we know that a lender, all, most lenders, if not all lenders, are not going to like it. But otherwise, if you've got a financing contingency, you're probably not going to win a multiple offer situation. Okay. And so, for newbies and intermediate guys, they know they just have to have an, a comfortable enough relationship with their lender. And the lender comfortable relationship with them on how each other underwrites, if they're going to show up for each other at closing and move forward, right? The other part is that I see lacking quite a bit. I just, I just closed on a deal last week that had 17 offers on it. It was in Orlando. Of the 17 offers, only five of the buyers toured the asset with me. I think that's huge. I don't care if you're from Calgary or not. If you're coming down, especially down to best and final, and you haven't seen the property when you're putting your seller hat on, do you really want to get into a contract two weeks later, you fly down from Calgary and take a look at it and, it, and it's just completely different than what you thought. And now you start having questions and now I've lost that ability to have that frenzy from buyers. The last thing I want to do as a broker is I have to go back to the buyers and talk about how you just backed out, yeah. right? And so, so that's, a, that's a big one I see lacking. Um, what about you know, non-refundable? You know, non -ref I, I see non-refundables. Um, it, it, it really depends on the, the desirability of the asset. I mean, sure. if it's something that's just badass, $300 a month value add, you know there ain't nothing wrong with it physically or structurally. 
Um, you've been waiting for that asset to come from available forever. It's owned by someone that's had it for 32 years. Um, and it's just the perfect value add. That's probably going to happen, right? Um, percentage wise for me, it's probably 30% of the time I see hard deposits day one. Okay. And usually it's a portion of the deposits yeah. and usually it's contingent on, uh, you know, title environmental and uh, survey. Right. Um, and, and typically that happens by people who already have a fairly decent understanding of that asset. Mm -hmm. Like they've bid on it before five years ago. They know the immediate surrounding. They own something next to it, right? That's how that usually happens. It, it's very unusual, despite what others may think, that five idiots just put down a hundred grand and don't know anything about it, right? I just don't yeah. see that. The guy who puts down a hundred grand doesn't know anything about it. Doesn't really exist. He's out of business, yeah. right? Yeah. These are usually pretty educated guesses on folks that are doing that. Yeah, it's Most due diligence periods are 30 days, unless it's a portfolio. Most closing periods are 30 days. You know, good buyers can get some swing in that, but most good buyers don't swing much from that. Yeah. I don't think sellers like um, closing extensions. Mm -hmm. So like when you're turning in an offer, mm -hmm. hey, I'm doing a 30-day due diligence, a 30-day close, and I can buy two 30-day periods for 50 grand each applicable towards a purchase price. Again, you're putting your seller hat on. What all you see is a 30-day due diligence and a 90-day close. That's right. Because that's what it is, yeah. right? Um, so I, I try to shy share, share, uh, share away, away from that. I also, I think sellers don't like seeing business days. I yeah. think it's kind of a used car salesman way it's of getting cute. extra time. It, it just pisses people off. It does. It doesn't make any sense. And, and most, for some reason, and I see, I see this again, probably 20% of the time buyer, it's like buyers think the sellers are going to like not catch that. Yeah. Not only they're not going to catch it, you're going to get dinged hard for it because now that they, now that they see you've put, especially when you go 30 calendar days and 30 business days, what that does to the human mind is now the seller is thinking, I'm going to read every yeah. single yeah. word of your PSA. I trust nothing you're doing. I'm going to be all over your ass. It's, right? it's, it's so true, Bo. I mean, um, <clears throat> I remember back when I was um, getting into the syndication and one of my partners, uh, he put in a clause and he, did, he told me why he was doing it. And it had to do with due diligence doesn't start until all materials are received. And, and initially it was like, oh, that's smart. Right. Because, but then, you know, he, he explained to me, well, you know, and I, I don't want to get into the, the nuances of it, but essentially you could, you could weasel out of your due diligence by saying, you know what, they didn't, they didn't upload a rent roll or they did, they forgot to up, right. uh, up, upload an expense or something to and that. Sellers know that now. Exactly. And it's just, you know, like, listen, it's smart on the buyer's part, but we're not in that kind of environment. And what it's saying is, is seller, I don't trust you. Yep. Yeah. You're starting off on the wrong foot. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, listen, the seller wants to sell this or they wouldn't have hired a broker and pay him, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to do so. Yes. If they weren't serious about selling and, and most sellers are pretty organized, especially the larger the asset. So let, let me ask you this. I'm, I'm curious. Do you get many pocket listings? Do you get many sellers that come to you and say, Bo, we don't want a full bid process. We don't want to market and list this. We just want you to uh, bring us a buyer, right? Like, yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious because I know that there's different ways of, of looking at it. And I'm just, <laughs> I, 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 I'm, this isn't- it's one like of my favorite proper. questions, Shane. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a great question. It's one of my favorite ones is what I educate buyers on a lot. Um, okay. So let me tell you about the couple different ways sellers call brokers, right? There's the guy who calls up and says, Bo, we want to list with you. You have the exclusive, give us a BOV. Um, we want you to go all the way out to market, all the websites, email blasting, call people, mail people, social media, the whole gamut, right? Um, and that's a good percentage of listings, definitely over 50%. Then there's the guy who calls up the broker and, and says, Bo, um, or, or the broker calls the seller. Broker calls the seller, hey, you know, they're, they're going for a listing opportunity. Um, hey, listen, I'd love to be able to bring you an offer. Seller says, 
hey, Bo, um, we're not looking to give you the exclusive or we won't hire you, but listen, you bring me X, I'll sell it, right? And so then that broker, we all know that if he said that to me, he probably said that to two or three other brokers. Mm -hmm. And now it's a race against each other to go find a buyer. Now, the vast majority of buyers who think that's an off-market deal, all it really means is it's not on a website. But with today's technology, brokers have access to hundreds and thousands of investors in a private phone call or private email capacity yes. to bring an offer. Now, the third way is, more along the lines of what you're talking about, is the seller calls up Bo and says, hey, Bo, we want to list with you. We want you to have the exclusive, but we don't want our staff to find out. We don't want our tenants to find out. We want this quiet. We don't own websites. We want you to take it to your personal database. But even then, okay, I'm still calling dozens, if not hundreds of investors, right? Because it, and, and, and by the way, most of the investors I'm calling are going to be really good buyers that I trust, right? That are not going to show up on the property and drive around and walk around and start asking questions to the maintenance guys, right? Yeah. Yeah. Those idiots aren't getting called. But I still have, and so does any broker, dozens and dozens of investors that I'm calling because I have a fiduciary responsibility to bring my seller the best offer at the best price. It doesn't make any sense I would, even, I would even say it's illegal in some ways, if not immoral, to take it to one or two guys. If I've been hired in exclusive capacity and my job is to bring that guy the biggest, highest price, why in the hell would I just call Shane? Right. What if Shane takes two weeks to give me an answer or brings me a stupid offer after two weeks? I have to play the odds game yeah. with the best people in that scenario. So you are always competing. I don't care how good the broker is and making you feel special like you're the only guy on the planet. You ain't. This is so important, I think, Bo, because um, like, look, I'm a very trusting uh, individual and I know sometimes that may kind of work against me, but um, I'm also not naive, right? And so you have to think brokers are salespeople and they are there to do a job and get the highest price in the shortest amount of time for their seller. And so to think to your point that it's only going to one person, you, you're, you're that special um, is, uh, um, is just not realistic. And so I'm, well, I, it was so yeah. good to hear that because sometimes I get the call, like I, I just got a call from a broker and I know that he's, you know, I'm probably on one of five people that he's calling first, sure. which, which is okay. Um, but anyway, sorry, I, I interrupted. Yeah, no, I, I, and listen, the, the, the number one true, in my opinion, what I would determine to be true off market deal. Listen, when you go on LinkedIn, everyone's doing an off market deal. It's horseshit. <laughs> they are one of dozens of people who look at that asset. Trust me. Yeah. But the one true one that happens is, and, I, and I've done several of these. So, so, so they exist. Yes. Is. Shane's Shane, the investor, is driving on Main Street with his wife. They're out of town. Drive. They're, they're vacationing in one of the markets they buy in. He calls me up on Saturday and says, "Hey, Bo, we just drove by Meridian Apartments. Um, it looks like the landscaping ain't going real well, you know. But I love the asset. I love the location. I used to own two assets down the road. Do you know that seller? Yeah, I man, I know that seller. I, I've, I've called him several times. He's, he's not a seller, but I'll reach out to him." And then I'll say, hey, Shane, do me a favor. So I'm not just some ordinary, you know, another broker calling the guy. Shoot me an email. Tell me that you're interested in this asset. Tell me you were driving by. Tell me the story that just happened. I'll forward your email to that seller. I'll call him up because I, I, I know all the sellers. And if the seller says, you know, shoot, as a matter of fact, my partners, I've been talking about selling. Yeah, you know, here's the price. And we do a deal. Those things happen. That's a true off-market deal. Um, and, and they're beautiful, right? And they're wonderful. Uh, but they're, they're much fewer and far between than most people think. So let me ask you this, because this is where, and I know it's a gray area, but I'd want to get your perspective on it, right? Because I think as an investor, if you're going to do that, and I've done it myself, because I think that that's, you know, the best way to get that credibility with the seller, should the buyer expect to pay the fee or is it a negotiation with the seller? Like, how do you, what would you recommend in that situation? Again, let's put our seller hat on, sure. right? So sellers sitting at home on Monday morning, Bo, call, Bo the broker calls him up. 
Hey, seller Sam, I just forwarded that email on Sunday. You probably saw it. Yeah, Bo, I saw that. Well, listen, um, you know, they're looking to turn an offer. I've done three deals with these guys. They're real deal. Um, and, and then I and then I say something like, hey, and by the way, um, you know, when they turn in an offer, I just want to kind of get the fee thing out of the way. You know, does 1% sound good? Does 2% sound good? You know, like I'm in, I'm in his graces, right? Like I brought him the deal. He didn't ask me. He ain't selling it. This is something that came in out of the blue. And so, to, you know, to a seller, um, for the benefit of not going to market and exposing it to the world and getting 15 offers, at minimum, the buyer should be paying the broker. Now, listen, you know, is it okay for the seller, for the broker to, to you know, to, to throw in there or add on to the price, the fee? Like the broker could call up the seller and say, hey, whatever the price is we agree to, yes. my buyer is fine with adding on to that the fee he's going to pay me so it doesn't cost you anything. That's one way to do it. That's yeah. But I think the yeah, I think the broker and the buyer should have an, an agreement in advance. Yeah. This is what you're going to pay me because I think if you can turn that in in the LOI up front that broker is paid broker is paid by the buyer, it just makes you look that much better. Yeah, I agree. It really and I, does. And and I think and the reason I brought it up is because uh, often, uh, especially new investors, they shy away from the commission conversation. And I can tell you, working with my father-in-law. Like one of the first things he does is he is trying to get a, a, a lay of the land, right? Do you have it listed? Is it exclusive? Or, you know, who's paying your fee? Right. Like, just like, let's just get the professional terms out of the way. Sure. Um, so that it, th there's no misunderstanding. Because I think sometimes what happens is, you know, you get too far down the road and now there's this uh, tension, if you will, right? Yeah. And, and yep. often a broker is going to be the one that, that raises it. But I think you as a buyer, uh, or, or in this case, like the investor raising it first, I think actually shows more um, uh, credibility. At least I, I don't know what your your perspective yeah, is. Yeah, and it's just not a. I mean, to me, it's just not a tough conversation. It's an it's an mm -hmm. expense. Like it's mm -hmm. a you know this is part of the deal, and yeah. I, and I think brokers and investors owe each other the clarity so they can plug it in their pro forma and yeah. and and take into consideration. And so. Um, you know, newer investors, if you're listening, you know, just have that conversation. It's not a, it's not a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Well, I want to be respectful of your time and I want to ask one kind of final question before we, um, uh, well, we'll have to do this again. If, if you're, if you're open, yeah, to man, it, because I, 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 I really enjoyed this conversation and there's so much more I'd like to talk to you about, but social media, your, your, uh, like, I, I remember, I remember when you first launched your YouTube channel, I, I shouldn't say when you first launched it, but I'm going to say maybe six to 12 months ago, you had a couple hundred subscribers. And today I'm running on the treadmill and I'm kind of doing a little bit of prep for, for a call. And I'm like, holy, he's, he's like over 2,100 subscribers right now. And so uh, what, like, what's the plan? Like, is this someone that you hired to help you? Or is this just right. Bo's disciplined, hard work, you know, figuring it out on his own. Like what's the, like, so, um, thank you for that. What's, what's really cool. And a lot of people don't, don't know this unless you're in the YouTube world, yes. but you know, yes, I have 2,100 subscribers, but what you don't see is the analytics on the backside. So 78% yes. of my regular watchers. Mm -hmm. Okay. The people who follow me, the people who watch all my videos, aren't subscribers. Wow. So you're getting so I, four times. So I, I'm in the tens of thousands yeah. of people who regularly watch my stuff. And, and, what, and the reason that, that exists is because YouTube's algorithm has gotten so good yeah. that as soon as you watch one or two of my videos, yes. as, you, as you'll see, it starts showing you all my videos on your homepage. Yeah. <laughs> so you think you're already subscribed. Yeah. Or you think you're already tuned into it, right? So like when you go on my YouTube right now, you'll see nothing but a bunch of cars. I'm a car nut. I'm a Porsche nut, right? Most of those channels, I'm not subscribed to at all, but I watch so many of those videos. I don't even know to look anymore to see what I'm subscribed. So the YouTube channel started July last year. And I, you know, I, 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 was, I might have mentioned this earlier, but I started following a guy named Ryan Serhant, who's a yep. residential broker in New York. He's famous yep. now. And I watched him take tours of assets. And I thought to myself, 
man, what if I could walk into a listing appointment and have a conversation with a seller about all the things I can do for him, which basically is what every broker can do for you, right? Everyone has the same databases. Everyone has the same websites. We, no one's really that much better than anybody else. But I thought to myself, if I had 80,000 subscribers or 100,000 people watching, whatever, I, I now have a quarter million views, right? Um, and so if I have a quarter million views at this point, that as soon as I do this incredible marketing video for you, people from all over the world, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, New York, anywhere you can think of, they're going to see a full tour of your asset. I felt like that was a competitive advantage. And there are a few people in the brokerage world who put themselves out there, right? They, I think a lot of commercial real estate guys historically have been stuffy. It's not their fault. That's how, that's how the brokerage business was. They feel like that's more of a residential agent kind of thing to have your picture on your business card, to have your yes. picture somewhere, to be out there in social media, to be crazy and wild. And I always like to do things that are opposite. A lot of times I don't do them right, but I knew video was the future and video gives a storyline to the property. I also started doing a lot of teaching videos, kind of putting things out there. A lot of it's um, based on things I see that need yes. to be corrected, or some of it is I just search on YouTube what other people are searching for and then do videos off that. And then the social media presence is just, I think you have to be everywhere. I think, I think a seller, when they can see the kind of reach you have, all they think about is, you know, I told you about that poll. It's yes. about likability and reachability, and it's about sales volume, right? So yes, they want to be able to like you and reach you, but you still have to be someone who sells stuff. And a guy who sells stuff has reach, yeah. right? <clears throat> And so anyway, I think a strong social media presence is big time. I think people can, you know, can make a, a strong living just being a marketing person. I feel like I'm a marketing person who has figured out real estate, not a real estate guy who has figured out marketing. That is uh, so interesting. It's, it's um, a similar philosophy. And that's why I asked you the question, because I, I want to I always like to understand the why behind why, but behind the the surface, right? In terms of like, okay, yeah. so I see this, but what's the reason behind it? Because then it allows me to just make small tweaks in terms of the type of content that I create and what. Like one of the uh, one of my mentors, he made the comment that he's like he doesn't want to show up or he doesn't want to have conversations with people that already that don't already have some level of um, what's the word uh, understanding of who he is. Right. And mm -hmm. let's face it, people are going to Google you. Right. I know before yes. anybody has a meeting with me, invest in a deal, talk, what, they're going to Google. Okay. So who is Shane? Oh, look at this. He's written a book. He has a podcast. He's, you know, and it's very yeah. simple to say in 30 minutes on their own time, I don't like Shane. That's okay. Right. At least it's better than sitting down with someone for 30 minutes to find that out because then it wastes two people's time. Right. Yeah. Versus, uh, you know, when they're at home watching Netflix, they can kind of quickly search around. Okay. He's got a right. family. And is that one of the other reasons that you, cause you don't, I, I've, I've also noticed some, some personal stuff that you share and obviously, you know, your, your office and whatnot. Is that another yeah. angle that you take to create that likability? Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, I've got a section, I've got a playlist in my YouTube channel that's called family and friends come first, which is, okay. which is actually a chapter in my book. Um, and it kind of goes off the theme of, you know, we're all in real estate, we're all in multifamily, we work insane hours. Most of us when we should really be, you know, working a finite number of hours so that we can have a life with our family, right? Yes. And so I try to I try to create a playlist that's about, you know, my hobbies, my family and the things I like to do to kind of show like, hey, like this is this is this is why we're working so hard, right? Is is to do cool things, to have hobbies, to go play on the weekend. And so anyway, that's that's why that part of the channel is in there. So it's not all business. <laughs> right. I love it. Well, Bo, where can people find more uh, and follow you, right? Both on YouTube. Yeah. We'll have the links in, in the show notes and whatnot. But obviously, sure. if someone's listening to this, I want them to be able to either remember it or be able to go and, and uh, search yeah. it. So. so three ways. Number one, my website is bowberry.com, B-E-A-U-B-E-E-R-Y.com. So whether you are in a Florida investor or not, doesn't matter where you are in the country. The reason you want to visit my website is I have all kinds of stats about the markets I cover. Um, if you go to the resources tab at the top, there's all kinds of great information. And the type of stats that I show for my markets 
are the stats you want to master for your markets. If you can master the kind of stuff I have on my website, I promise brokers will be bringing you deals like crazy, especially when you speak in that manner, they'll know this dude knows what he's talking about. Yep. Second way to reach me is my YouTube channel. It's called Bo Knows Multifamily, kind of like the Bo Jackson football player back in the day. Um, and it's got all kinds of helpful information for advanced level investors, beginning investors, um, analytics. Uh, you know, if you're a car guy, you got some car guy stuff in there. Um, and then third way is, you know, not to plug the book shamelessly, but I really think you should pick up my book. It's called Multifamily Investors Who Dominate. This is what it looks like. Um, it's a pretty short 100 pages. You can read it in a few hours. It's on Amazon and hardcover. It's on Audible. It's on Kindle. And I promise you, it'll be the, uh, the most different book on this subject matter you've read. You know, in my, uh, the way I would describe it is you understand the game. Like when you read this book, you'll understand the game that's getting played. And mm. I think often Thank uh, you. Yeah. new investors, when they come into commercial real estate, even seasoned investors, they don't, if they haven't worked in the various, um, if they haven't seen it from different angles, the lending, the brokerage, the investor, like, unfortunately, you're, you're playing a game without the full set of the, the without the rule book. And so your book right. kind of provides that um, uh, insight in, in so that it's like, oh, okay, like to your point, put on your seller's hat, put on your broker's hat and come at it from a different angle so that you can, you can position yourself to win those competitive offers. Cause that's where you're at today. Empathy is the number one competitive advantage of the, of the elite guys I talk about in that book. When I watch how long they've been successful and how many time, how many years in a row they've done a crazy number of deals, yeah. they all have an incredible empathy for the other side. They're trying to figure out how to get the deal completed Yes. With their reputation having been built, not suffered. I love it. Right. So when you see a red line, instead of talking about how insane the seller was for having a red line that particular thing, think why is he redlining? Why is that his concern? And have a reasonable discussion about it. Yeah. And that goes for almost anything that comes up. And by the way, it attracts the hell out of me to you when you have that mindset. I want to bring you more deals because you're going to try to do a deal with a reputation, not be a bull in the China shop. Love it. Bo, well, this has been tremendous. I really right, uh, brother. appreciate you coming on, having this conversation. And uh, now that I, I put you on the spot, you will be coming back. So this is, uh, this will be no, awesome. fun to I do round two. So thank you very much, Bo. Thanks, man. You bet.